Today's video is going to be the all-cooked fantasy football team. It's one of those meals that you put onto the stovetop. The frying pan was already at extra high heat. You put the food on, and then 19 minutes later, the smoke alarm goes off because you forgot that shit was on there. This team, these 10 players I'm going to talk about today, when you go to make tea and you put the water in the kettle and you forget about it, and then you go back an hour later and there's no water left. These are the waterless tea players. This is the all-cooked team. We're talking about 10 players that I never, ever, ever want to draft in fantasy football again. Maybe they've burned you. Maybe there are other reasons behind it. We're going to get into all of them today. Y'all know what to do first. Tuck your shirts in. Yeah. I want to be clear on a few things here before we get to the list. If you like this fucking video, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the button that looks like this. These players are not just my, you know, fade list 2023. These are players that I'm never going to have on a season-long fantasy team again for the rest of my short life, okay? Now, listen, also on that note, the videos that I make around this time of the year when we're doing top five or seven or ten lists or whatever, these are pertaining to your season-long leagues, okay? The ones where you actually draft the team and do sit starts and lineups and shit like that. Underdog fantasy, when we're talking about just best ball, whole different animal. I will draft upwards of like 200 to 300 teams on underdog on these best ball platforms. So nothing I say in these is relevant as it relates to never drafting. We diversify when we get up to that number of drafts. We're talking about the people that are in three to five drafts. And some of these players are going to be wildly obvious. Their ADPs are shooting through the roof, but I need to get down on paper that they'll never be on a team that I have ever again. We're going to start at the wide receiver position. And the first player that comes to mind just immediately is Juju Smith-Schuster. His ADP is the highest amongst, I think, everybody on this list. He's going at pick 100 right now, wide receiver 49 off the board. I understand that that's not very early in drafts, but that is too early in drafts for Juju Smith-Schuster. If I had made this list two years ago, I would have put Juju on it. He has been miserable as a separator. As a wide receiver, you have to be able to separate. Unless you're Mike Williams, unless you're like six foot four and can jump 48 inches into the air and have crispy ass hands, you need to be able to separate. He is literally one of the worst NFL receivers at separating against man and press coverage since he's gotten into the league. And now he's moving from Kansas City's offense, which threw the ball 38 times a game, fifth in the NFL, over to New England's 32 passes per game, 31.8 to be exact, 22nd in the NFL. He's replacing Jacoby Myers, who actually was able to separate. There just aren't many receivers in the NFL that have done less with more opportunity than Juju has gotten. Like the amount of targets he's gotten, not earned, gotten over the last three or four years. And he continues to turn them into like 8.4 yards per reception, 8.5 yards per reception because he gets tackled immediately. And the craziest part about it is that he's just still 19 years old. He played 16 games last year with a quarterback that threw 41 touchdowns and he scored three times. What do you think happens when he moves over to a quarterback? Flip those numbers. 41 passing touchdowns for Mahomes, 14 passing touchdowns for Mac Jones. The Patriots as a team averaged 1.1 passing touchdowns per game last year. Sure, they'll be a little bit better without Matt Patricia calling the fucking plays over there, but I'm not expecting much out of Mac Jones. The only saving grace is if Uncle Bill forces you to, to delete TikTok off his phone before OTAs begin. It's not going to happen. Juju getting onto my team again, not going to happen. Next player up, Odell Beckham. I talked about him in the seven players to let your idiot league mates video to draft last week. Very popular video on the channel. If you're new here and you haven't seen that, we will link that down below. Go check that out afterwards. Odell Beckham Jr., again, not a guy that I am going to go too in-depth with. Current ADP, 111 overall. Wide receiver, 53. Insane that he caught an $18 million per year bag from Baltimore. But when you look at the offense, man, Zay Flowers, Rashad Bateman, Mark Andrews, J.K. Dobbins, all younger, more explosive players in that offense. Beckham is not going to be the number one target. I'd be surprised. I'd be more surprised that he was the number two target than the number four target by the end of the year. And everyone can keep calling like his injuries freak injuries. Freak injuries lives matter, okay? Scar tissue is real. Scar tissue adds up. When you're an older player and you continue to fracture your ankle and tear your ACLs and shit, those things matter. You can call them freak injuries if you want and say they're never going to happen again, but your body takes a fucking toll. He's turning 31 this year. It, it's over. And, and it's sad because OBJ is going to go down as like, you ever have those sports conversations with your friends or just like on Twitter, you see it's like, if you can go back and have one athlete in any sport uh, stay healthy for the entirety of his career, I feel like a lot of people in the younger generation would pick OBJ as that guy because he was just so electric coming into his prime. And then these 
freak injuries happened, and now he's just, you know, he went from 25, the most electric player in the NFL, to 31 and washed like that. So I just, I don't know. I look up the makeup of this team, and again, younger, more explosive options in the passing game. Sure, Todd Munkin is there, and they're going to throw the ball a little bit more, but, like, it's not a very high bar. They've literally ranked almost dead last, if not dead last, every single year that Lamar Jackson has been under center as their quarterback, even if they get another 100 pass attempts this year, it's still spread out between a lot of guys, and the overall pass attempt number is not that high to begin with. So using a single-digit round capital on OBJ this year seems like fucking lunacy, and that's what that pick is. And when you look at that ADP on underdog of 111 or 110, wherever he is, there's Alvin Kamara, Samaja P. Ryan, Brian Robinson, Devon A. Chain, Antonio Gibson, Rashad Penny, like, that's crazy. But let's move over to some of the running backs that I think are crazy to draft ever again. And Kenneth Gainwell tops the list for me. We're going to do the same thing with Kenneth Gainwell every single year, it feels like. The, the Eagles have been so vocal with their words, with their actions, with their spirit about what they do and don't want to do with Kenneth Gainwell. He has been in Philly for two years now. He has caught 33 passes and 23 passes over those seasons. His target total dipped from 50 down to 29 last year, despite playing in one more game than he did two years ago. And his reception numbers dipped from 33 down to 23, despite playing in one more game than he did the previous year. And Miles Sanders was basically not involved in the passing game whatsoever. You might say, oh, well, Jalen Hurts doesn't throw the ball to his running backs. That's why. Well, guess what? Jalen Hurts just signed a fucking contract extension. So that's going to be a problem for the rest of Kenneth Gainwell's career, most likely. I get it. He had a cute little playoff run last year. We're literally talking about a two-game sample size, right? And one of those games in which he had 72 yards on 16 touches, 4.5 yards per touch. That's not a good number for a pass catching back. And even that glimpse of usage can probably be attributed to the fact that they didn't trust Miles Sanders. If you saw Miles Sanders on Twitter like yesterday, or a few days ago, he was talking Talking about how he left because they didn't trust him in the Super Bowl. They stopped giving him touches. They just stopped trusting Miles Sanders, and that's why he's gone. In the regular season last year, 17 games, Kenneth Gainwell topped five carries one time. In those 17 regular season games, he had zero targets as many times as he did three or more targets. For a guy that's a pass-catching dynamo, it's not great, Bob. It's not great, Bob. I'm not denying his skill in the passing game. He is a very talented pass-catching running back. He was awesome at Memphis when he did it, but he was never a good runner, not even at Memphis when he was putting up statistics. He was never a good inside runner, and the Eagles know that, hence them continuing to add to their backfield with DeAndre Swift and Rashad Penny when losing Miles Sanders. Like he, Gainwell is a low-ceiling, low-floor player that has literally a 0% chance of ever being a workhorse. They continue to come out and be like, we need a committee, we need a committee. Gainwell is a pass-catching back. He's a depth piece at the best. He'll never get goal line work. Jalen Hurst doesn't throw to those fucking running backs. They have Swift. They have Penny. They always use a committee. Just get him completely off your board. Same thing with Clyde edwards Lair. He's like almost a more expensive version of Kenneth Gainwell. This is another one where their running backs are obviously Jarek McKinnon, who resigned, and Isaiah Pacheco. So they used a first round pick on Clyde edwards Lair a few years ago, and now they are playing a seventh round pick, Isaiah Pacheco, over him. Very clearly, he was a healthy scratch in a lot of games last year, got hurt. Everyone's like, he was so good at the beginning of last year. He wasn't good. He just scored touchdowns. That's going to any, literally fucking any running back can score touchdowns in the Kansas City Chiefs offense. Like That's what this offense does. And the problem with a lot of these running backs, if they're not going to catch a high number of passes, is they throw the ball at an insane rate, as they should, because they have Patrick Mahomes. When they're down inside the 10-yard line, they're throwing the ball at the number one rate in the NFL. They are always throwing the damn ball when it matters. Who cares about empty calorie carries inside the 20-yard lines? And if Kyle Rosler even gets onto the fucking field, that is probably all he's going to be seeing. And Pacheco is pretty much the goal line back there. So that Clyde, he was just a failed experiment. He was cool in college. I get it. Will he land somewhere else after this? I don't know if he, I mean, I'm sure he will because he's a former first round pick, but he's going to be like, basically, I think he'll land somewhere as as like Devin Singletary landed in Houston this offseason, clearly behind Damian Pierce. And people are going to get all fucking hard and excited about him. You know, this is a cool little underrated landing spot. No. No, 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 no. Clyde Edwards Hilaire is just done with fantasy football. I want to bring up a few tweets real quick from this Philadelphia Eagles beat reporter. I talked about this in the mock draft video that I did a few days ago that I put up on the channel, but I want to dive in a little bit more because I think it's relevant to the next couple guys on this list. This dude, Elliot Shore Parks, he's an absolute clown. Like his reports are just unhinged half the time and I don't trust anything he says, but I want to make a bigger point surrounding the point that he made. Okay. So he tweets out, I think Trey Sermon is going to push for a roster spot 
Penny is my potential surprise cut trade. And he goes on to talk about who the locks are and et cetera, why he thinks that. And I quote tweeted it and I said, I definitely wouldn't put money on Rashad Penny getting cut, but it's the reason I've been hesitantly fading guys like him and Damian Harris this offseason. NFL teams that give these guys million dollar contracts don't care what they did for your fantasy team in 2019. And then I tweeted out something else afterwards because it got the brain fucking juice in a little bit. And I said, guys that will make people on Twitter lose their mind if they were to get cut, but shouldn't. Damian Harris, Rashad Penny, James Robinson, Keyshawn Vaughn, any Jets running back not named Brees Hall or Dalvin Cook. Uh, and Gus Edwards, I said, would have fit here, but his salary is $2 million and his dead cap is $4 million. So they'd actually lose money if they did that. It'd be a dumb business deal for them. However, the point is these dudes are older, a lot of them coming off of injuries. And again, those things add up. And these teams have no real financial incentive to keep these guys on the field. So it doesn't mean that they're going to cut them, but it means that they're on a very short leash going into training camp. If the team sees something that they do not like with any of these players, again, they're not incentivized. If someone coming off uh, a bunch of severe injuries like Rashad Penny lost a step or two, right? There's eventually going to going to come a time when he has lost a step or two, right? It's going to happen. There's only so many years in a row that he could be really, really efficient for five games and then suffer a season ending injury. Eventually, those things will add up and he will lose a step. And if that happens in training camp and if you see younger, more explosive backs come up and surprise a team, those types of guys will be the first guys cut off of the roster, despite them being a buzzy, hyped fantasy type running back. One of the guys that I kind of didn't but did but also didn't unless put on this list was Gus Edwards. He is the next one on this list that will never see the light of day on a fantasy team of mine. Again, he is a sneaky 28 years old, all right? Dobbins is still 24. Gus missed all of 2021 with an ACL tear. Last year, he played nine games, but he was still dealing with the lack of strength in his knee, so he was recovering from the knee problems. He also dealt with hamstring injuries, hamstring issues, which were probably more of like a compensatory thing with the ACL not being at full strength, concussion issues. I mean, it was a tough year for him. Supposedly, he's going to be a full go by training camp. I don't care, nor do I believe any of those types of reports until we see it. I don't I don't understand what the point of getting really excited about it right now is when training camp is coming soon and we'll actually know. I'm just not expecting to see the Gus of old. And you hate to see it because he's a very easy guy to root for. He's a guy that was like continuously underrated throughout his NFL career. And he's a guy that like never really had three down capabilities. So he was never going to catch the bag. He was never going to be a guy that got like super hyped up, but he was always a great piece of the Ravens and sneaky, like 10 touches a game for fantasy when it have big games, he's always good on the football field. But if this is a more pass heavy offense in Baltimore with Todd Munkin coming in and all these passing weapons getting added to the team, the biggest loser here is Gus. If he even has a big role going into this year, I expect J.K. Dobbins to be the workhorse there. This dude is like a stone hand version of Jordan Howard, which is not great. If you look at the list of active running backs with the most carries without a receiving touchdown, Josh Jacobs somehow up there at 1,072 carries. Gus Edwards at 501, number two on the active running backs with the most carries without a receiving touchdown. So Gus is off my board. Again, I, I get it. Like people are going to be like, no, nah, I want to draft Gus. Very easy dude to root for. Sneaky 28 years old, sneaky 28. And now we're talking about two seasons in a row where it's either completely gone with injuries or half the season was taken with injuries. I think we're chasing a player's prime who is clearly very far past it. I, I'm not touching Gus Edwards this year. Also not touching James Robinson this year. I think it is a 50-50 chance for him to even make the team in New England. They signed him to like a small deal, but if they cut him, the dead cap is not high. So they have no real financial incentive to keep him on the roster. Uh, he's another sad story like Gus, man. He's he's only turning 25, um, but the Achilles injury that he suffered is far worse to explosiveness and just the longevity of an RB's career than someone like Gus who suffered the ACL tear. So, you know, you talk about the ages. I'm less worried about a younger player coming back from an ACL tear. I'm far more concerned about an older player, but the Achilles is obviously something to be wildly concerned about. I look at I look at the the depth chart there in New England, and I think they really really like all three backs that they have there already with Ramondre, Pear Strong, and Kevin Harris. And when you look at like James Robinson, he was bad last year. Outside of like two runs, rushing yards over expected per carry, bottom seven among forty two running backs. James Robinson was tied for dead last with Michael Carter and Leonard Fournette. And now he's been. This is his third team. The Patriots are going to be his third team in a single calendar year. Typically, not a great sign. Um, he was a healthy scratch for the Jets the final five weeks of the season. Uh, Bill Belichick came out and literally said, like James Robinson, he's a depth signing, quote unquote. Like those are his words. He is a depth signing, not like he's going to compete to like get carries and stuff. He is a depth signing. 
Again, there's a super real chance that this dude just does not make the roster. So James Robinson, an obvious name. Most of these guys are obvious, but a lot of people like to get cute, especially if you're drafting at the end of your drafts or, you know, a lot of people play underdog. They play these best ball leagues where you need to make picks from rounds 15, 16, 17, 18, sometimes up to 20 rounds. These are dudes that just will not make the cut for me. Let's move over to the tight end position. And again, I ask you, if you're enjoying the video, hit the button that looks like this and subscribe to the channel if you're new. Mike Gesicki. Also on the Patriots. Wow, we got a lot of Patriots on this list. We got Juju. We got James Robinson. I'm expecting a shit year from this offense once again. But for just about every fucking underlying metric, Mike Isicki is just not good at football. Look at his 2022 numbers. Among 48 tight ends with 25 or more targets, his ranks among 48 tight ends, 44th in catch rate, 29th in yards per target, despite being number five in average depth of target. That is, that's hard to do. 46th in yards after the catch. He is legitimately one of the worst players with the ball in his hands in the entire NFL. He's been this exact same way since he came into the league. This is a tweet I put out three summers ago, 2019. Mike Isicki broke zero tackles on his 51 receptions in 2019. The only tight end with a worse broken tackle rate is Jason Witten, who had zero broken tackles on 63 receptions. And people like to be like, this is not a sticky stat. It is fucking sticky for Mike Kosicki. The yards after catch, the lack of yards after catch is something. It's crazy because he is such a good athlete on paper. In gym shorts, this is why you don't buy into Twitter clips. They don't fucking matter, okay? In 2022, he forced one missed tackle on his 32 catches. In 2021, he forced three missed tackles on 73 catches. Same thing with 2020, three missed tackles on 53 catches. And the year prior, 2019, zero tackles missed, forced on 51 catches. It's truly impressive how bad he is at that, given his athleticism. And don't fucking talk to me about how they're talking about they're going to line him up at wide receiver. When the fuck is a tight end converting to wide receiver? ever happened slash worked in the NFL. Didn't the Dolphins say the same exact shit? I'd honestly rather have Hunter Henry than Mike Kosicki. Next player up on this list, another tight end, Zacher to the Arizona Cardinals. It just, just here's a rule of thumb. Stop drafting really old players coming back from torn ACLs or any significant lower body injury at the end of the year. Any single player that fits into what I just said should just never be drafted again. Zach Ertz did not just tear his ACL. He also tore, tear, tore his MCL in November, in week 10, had surgery in December. Okay, it's just it's the older players are just slower to return from these types of injuries. And by the time they're like 29, 30, which Ertz is past 30, they've already lost a step from their 23 year old self without injury. So you're talking about adding another lost step. It's just goodbye. Like they're going into rebuilding. They're selling all their future. They're selling all their picks this year. They're going into future rebuild mode. Trey McBride was the first tight end drafted in the NFL draft two years ago. There's a decent chance that Zach Ertz is not even ready to start the year that he begins the year on pup like. Don't get cute with Zach Ertz, please. I think that might have been the list. I think I had Jimmy G up top as really the only quarterback I had on this list, but I talked about Jimmy G a lot. The main point is he's going over to fucking Vegas. San Francisco, which is any quarterback, would succeed in that system. Like the yards after catch per reception by the receivers, Jimmy G is ranked number one amongst quarterbacks in three of the last four years. The Raiders didn't have a positional player inside of the top 30 last year in that statistic outside of Foster Moreau, who is not on the team anymore. So I'm completely off of him. And uh, some of you guys might be asking, how is Michael Thomas not on this list? I know he's left a sour taste, a sour taste in many people's mouths. He's not someone I'll never draft again. He's going kind of late in drafts. He's going like ninth, 10th round, single digit. I probably won't pull the trigger. These other guys, I just want at no cost. Like there's no cost that I want any of these dudes on my team. Michael Thomas, I would take if he falls. I would like to see what he has left. I'm not expecting much because if you look at his profile on reception perception, we will link his profile down below. This is absolutely a resource worth paying for by Matt Harmon. He's just not the separator that he was anymore. Again, coming off of major lower body injuries, these things add up and these things tend to happen to older players. He's another one that age sneaks up, man. He's turning 29 this week, so he will be old as it pertains to fantasy football by the time the season starts. He was a dominant separator when he came into the league. He is no longer that dominant player anymore. So he's not someone I'm completely off of. I would understand if you never wanted to draft him again, but I am not officially putting him on this list. He's honorable mention, but not worth mentioning honorably on the list. That's all I got for you today. I don't even know how many players I did. I might've done seven and I might've done 11 for all the fuck it. No. All right. I'm out of here. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you're new. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Yeah, that's it.